Hey everyone, this is the first video in a series of videos on the spine and the spinal cord. The spine includes all of these vertebrae. It also includes the spinal cord, which is this nervous tissue that runs from the brain up here down through those vertebrae, and it's got all these spinal nerves that branch out of the sides. That spinal cord and spinal nerves, along with some cranial nerves that come directly from the brain, are gonna be the main way that your brain sends signals to the rest of your body to control your movements. Those nerves are also a way that your brain is gonna get information. So whenever you feel something, signals will travel up through those spinal nerves, up through the spinal cord, and then to the brain. For this video specifically, we're gonna cover the different regions of the spinal cord and the spinal nerves that come from those, as well as talk a little bit about what does each of those nerves control or do. Also, I myself have a spinal cord injury, so this topic is particularly of interest to me. So I'll include some details about my own injury throughout this series as well. All right, without further ado, let's jump to the whiteboard and get started. We're gonna start with an outline of the human body. At the top of that, we're gonna draw a picture of the brain. And the brain, of course, is where the signals that we use to control the body are gonna come from. It's also where the sensory input that comes from the rest of the body is gonna travel up to. Also, check out my brain videos if you wanna know more about the brain. And descending down from the brain is the spinal cord. Now, I'm not gonna draw the whole spinal cord all at once, but we're gonna start with the top section and then work our way down. So this first section at the top or most superior section is called the cervical region of the spinal cord. There's gonna be eight cervical nerves that extend out to the sides of that section. And the naming convention for these nerves is pretty easy. We've got C1 here at the top. There's eight of those. So it'll go C1, C2, C3, all the way down to C8 at the bottom of that section. Now on this side of my diagram, I'm just gonna label the names of the nerves. And then over here, we're gonna talk about what they do. But over here on the other side, I'm gonna draw a little bit more anatomically correct of what those nerves look like as they kind of branch out from the spinal cord. So in the cervical region over here, a lot of these nerves are gonna kind of twist around. They'll branch out they'll converge, they're gonna form the section called the brachial plexus. Brachial is always referring to the arm, and so these nerves are gonna extend down the arm. And we use the term plexus anytime we've got a group of these nerves that kind of branch around with each other. So we've got the brachial plexus there. All right, so what do these nerves do? Before we get into that, we need to learn a few more terms here. The first of which is somatic. The somatic division of the nervous system is gonna be our sensory and motor divisions. Motor is whenever we have a signal coming from the brain and going out to the body, such as whenever I tell my hand to move. That would be a somatic action potential traveling from my brain down my spinal cord, out through those cervical nerves, and then to the muscles in my arm and hand to cause all that movement to happen. And sensory would be like if I touch something and that signal from that touch sensation travels through a nerve, through the cervical nerves there, up through the spinal cord, and then up into my brain where my brain can interpret that signal. The idea that kind of unites those under this umbrella of somatic is they're both conscious things. So if I'm touching or feeling something, I can do that consciously. I can think about whatever I'm touching as well as my motor signals. Whenever I'm moving around, I'm consciously controlling my movements. Things that are controlled by this that we don't consciously think about, we call those autonomic. And I think about this term autonomic kind of like automatic. It's sort of automatically happening without me having conscious thoughts about it. It's still controlled by my brain. My brain is sending signals back and forth through different parts of my body to control things that I'm not actively thinking about. An example of that would be like digestion. I can't really think about like, oh, let me tell my intestines to do stuff to digest the food or to absorb the nutrients. That's happening and it's regulated autonomically by the brain. So for each of these sections of spinal nerves that we look at, we're going to talk about what does it do in the somatic division, which is where we consciously have thought about what we're doing. And then what does it do in the autonomic division, the stuff that we're not consciously thinking about, the stuff happening automatically. Also, quick note right here, the somatic does include sensory and motor, but all the information I'm giving you here is really based on the motor division control. And I'm also not getting super precise with this. I'm going to give you kind of nerve regions and sections of the different nerves. But if you're really going in depth and you want to know exactly what C7 controls specifically, then I'm not going to get quite to that level of detail in this video. All right, with all that out of the way, let's talk about the cervical nerves. All of these cervical nerves, C1 through 8, they're gonna control movements of the neck. Let me utilize those cervical nerves. Cervical just means round or circular, and so think about the neck being this like kind of circle or cylinder there. That's where we get that term cervical for, for the neck. And if you just look at the location of those nerves, right, they, they're they right there at the neck, so it makes sense that those are gonna control neck movements. What about your like facial movements? Most of that's gonna be controlled by cranial nerves, which we're not gonna get into this video. That'll be a separate video. So all of those nerves are gonna be involved in regulating the neck. Specifically, C3 through five is gonna help control the diaphragm. So anytime that you're breathing or singing, use your diaphragm. Me, 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 me. C3 through five is gonna control the diaphragm, which is gonna regulate your breathing. Your lungs aren't the ones actually controlling the breathing. That's, that's your diaphragm and intercostal muscles between the ribs. And then nerves C5 through eight are gonna help control the shoulder, 
the arm, and some of the hand. Those are going to be the lower nerves in the cervical region, and those are going to be the ones that form this brachial plexus that are going to go down into the arm and the hand in that region. Now let's talk a little bit about spinal cord injury. What if somebody had a spinal cord injury in this neck area? Well, generally, whenever there's a spinal cord injury, somebody's going to lose function of things that are below the region where the damage is. Usually reflexes will still work down in the lower regions. I'll get into why that is in another video, but signals won't be able to get all the way up to the brain or from the brain down to any region that, is, that are below that injury site. I'm also talking about what's called a complete spinal cord injury. So there are incomplete spinal cord injuries too, where some signals can pass through, but not all. But in general, I'm talking about complete spinal cord injuries where no signals can pass by. So if somebody had a complete spinal cord injury, let's say at the C5 region, then they would have some neck control. Um, they would have some diaphragm control so they could control their breathing, but then they would have a lot of loss of function in the shoulder, arm, hand, and kind of everywhere below that part of the body. If that injury were higher, like up in the C1 region, then they would have trouble breathing on their own. And so they might have to have some assistive device to help them breathe because they wouldn't have brain control over their diaphragm and regulating their breathing. My spinal cord injury is gonna be a lot lower down in the lumbar region, so we'll get to that a little bit more later. All right, what about autonomic control? Well, it turns out that the cervical nerves don't have any autonomic function, so they're not gonna be regulating anything that happens sort of automatically or involuntarily. All right, for organization on my diagram here, when we get to the next regions, I've got these green lines to kind of separate it out. It'll make more sense as we go through it. All right, the next region, just inferior or below the cervical, is gonna be the thoracic region of the spinal cord, and that's gonna include 12 thoracic nerves. So the nerve immediately inferior to C8 is gonna be T1, or thoracic nerve number one. That's gonna number all the way down T1, T2, T3, all the way down to T12 at the very bottom of the thoracic region. What really distinguishes these from the cervical nerves above and the lumbar nerves below is that each of these corresponds with a vertebrae that's gonna be connected to a rib. So we have 12 ribs, therefore we're gonna have 12 thoracic vertebrae. These thoracic nerves aren't forming any sort of a plexus, but they're going to all of these parts of the kind of the torso right here. So we had cervical on the neck, remember cervical means round, and then below that we have thoracic, just like the thoracic cavity here, or I think of Jurassic Park, I mean, Jurassic Park. If you think about like dinosaurs and their skeletons, you see all those ribs and stuff. The Jurassic sounds like thoracic, the ribs, this corresponds with the ribs. It's a bit of a stretch, but if it helps you remember thoracic, great. The Jurassic nerves, I mean, thoracic nerves. All right, what do those thoracic nerves do? So T1 through six are gonna control the intercostal muscles, which are gonna be the muscles between your ribs. Those muscles help with breathing by kind of pulling your ribs out like this, and other regions of the trunk above the waist, which makes sense. T1 through six, they're right in that region. They're gonna kind of branch down. They're gonna control all of that trunk region. The rest of those thoracic nerves are gonna be controlling your abdominal muscles. So the muscles you use whenever you do sit-ups, or for me, whenever I'm like sitting up straight in my wheelchair, I'm using those thoracic nerves to control my abdominal muscles to keep me sitting up. Now my balance sitting up isn't great. That's because there's other muscles that I don't have control of, like muscles on my leg and that sort of thing. But if somebody has a spinal cord injury somewhere in that thoracic region, that's gonna limit their trunk muscles and abdominal muscles. So they're gonna have a hard time kind of sitting up straight on their own without some back support or other support to help them sit. Now, if you think about where those thoracic nerves are located, all of this region right here of your torso is where all of your internal organs are, like your lungs and heart and liver and spleen and pancreas and intestines. Most of those are organs that we don't voluntarily control. So we need some autonomic or automatic control of those regions. So this is gonna be where the sympathetic stress response is taking place or it's regulated by the body. The sympathetic stimulation is your stress response. So anytime you're in a stressful situation, all these changes happen in the body. That could be anything from your heart beating faster, your lungs breathing harder, your digestive system becoming less active because if you're in danger, you don't need to be focused on absorbing nutrients and food. You need to be focused on getting to safety. So all of that stress response is gonna be regulated by those thoracic nerves, which are sending signals to those organs down in here to prioritize safety over kind of your rest and digest response. So thoracic nerves for sympathetic stimulation or stress response. Now just inferior to the thoracic is gonna be the lumbar section of the spinal cord. The lumbar is gonna have five different nerves that are extending out from it. So we've got L1 there at the top or superior side of that, and then L5 down at the inferior or lower part of that. This section is gonna to start to form a plexus over here. So as those nerves extend out, they're gonna branch and converge and form this kind of web of nerve tissue. We're gonna call that the lumbar plexus. You also notice on the diagram that in the cervical and the thoracic region, 
regions, we had sort of one tube that's forming the spinal cord. But as we get down to the lumbar, that tube starts to branch out. And we don't have just this single tube going down forming the spinal cord. It's going to be this kind of horse's tail-like looking thing. In fact, that's how it got its name. It's called the cauda equina which just means horsetail in Latin. So that cauda equina is where that single tube of the spinal cord kind of branches and becomes sort of this, uh, this mess of smaller tubes that are forming that cauda equina. Now the lumbar are also involved in that sympathetic stimulation or stress response. So I said thoracic, it's really gonna be the thoracic and the lumbar. Both of those are gonna be controlling our stress response. So whenever we get stressed out, we see something that's gonna cause us to maybe be in danger or we got a big test coming up or a conversation that we're nervous about and our body goes in that stress response. Signals will go from the brain down through the spinal cord, out through both the thoracic nerves and the lumbar nerves in order to control or regulate that sympathetic stimulation, our stress response. Now there's gonna be some overlap with the lumbar and our next section, which is the sacral, when it comes to the somatic, the sensory and the motor division here. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that sacral section and then we'll talk about what the lumbar and sacral section does in the somatic division. So here we've got the sacral division. And the sacral division is going to have five nerves. So we have S1 at the top or superior section and S5 down there in the inferior or bottom section. So we've got the lumbar and the lower back region. And then we've got the sacral down below that. I can turn around here and demonstrate this a little bit. We've got the cervical and we've got the thoracic down here. And then we've got the lumbar is the lower back. And then the sacral is going to be kind of down at the very bottom or base of the spine. All right. So what do those lumbar and sacral nerves control? Well, L1 through S5 and that's gonna be really that whole region right there is gonna be controlling your hips, your legs, and your feet. I didn't separate it out into just the lumbar and just the sacral because there's a lot of overlap in which of those control those different parts of the hips and legs and feet. So in this video, we're not gonna go into all of the specifics of that. But that hopefully makes some sense if you just think about where those are located, right? Those are at the very end there. So your hips are gonna be right in that area and then your legs and feet are down from there. And so all of these lumbar and sacral nerves they're gonna branch out and they're gonna go down into the hip and the leg area to control all of that. Those sacral nerves specifically are gonna be involved in something else, not the sympathetic, but the parasympathetic stimulation. And that's gonna be in the autonomic. This is again, the automatic or involuntarily controlled parts of the body. And to get a little bit more specific with that, this is gonna be parasympathetic stimulation of the bladder, which is gonna be contraction of the bladder, as well as reproductive organs. So when you're more relaxed, that's gonna cause your bladder to contract. It's also gonna cause increased blood flow to the reproductive organs. If you're stressed out, the reproductive system doesn't work as well. It's also harder to, to urinate if you're stressed out. Now that's obviously just a couple parts of parasympathetic stimulation and we're running out of sections of the spinal cord here. So where does the parasympathetic stimulation occur for the rest of the parts of the body? Like how's the brain gonna tell the heart to slow down whenever you're in your parasympathetic or rest and digest response. Well, that's all gonna take place through the cranial nerves. And I said we aren't gonna talk about the cranial nerves in here, and we're not gonna get into the specifics, but I really wanna kind of finish this diagram out and talk about where parasympathetic response occurs. So that's gonna be in your cranial nerves, and you've got cranial nerves that are gonna go down kind of through the neck, directly from the brain, so not through the spinal cord, directly from the brain, down to some of those organs down in here to do that parasympathetic response or the rest and digest response. That would be things like slowing down your heart and your lungs, but also increasing your digestion, telling the pancreas, for example, to release more digestive enzymes. All right, we have one more nerve to talk about in the spinal cord, and that's gonna be the coccygeal nerve. The coccyx is your tailbone, and so the coccygeal nerve is gonna be a nerve that kind of comes out by that tailbone at the very base of the spine. That coccygeal nerve doesn't really have any motor control, and like I said, this is all motor stuff right here, so I did wanna include a little bit about it. It's gonna be tailbone sensation. So the sensation on your tailbone, that's gonna be from the coccygeal nerve. And to finish out the diagram over here on this side, let's draw out where those nerves branch down and kind of where they go. You can see here, there's another sort of web-like section of nervous tissue. And so up here, we have the lumbar plexus. Down here, we're gonna have the sacral plexus. Again, it's just another kind of web-like system of nerves that kind of branch in and out of each other. So we call it a plexus. This one's the sacral plexus. Those nerves of the sacral plexus tend to converge down right here and form a nerve that's gonna go down through the leg to regulate movement and sensation in the legs and feet and toes. Now I said I was gonna talk a little bit more about my disability. So my disability is a complete spinal cord injury of the L2 and L3 vertebrae or the nerve that's right there between those. And so my injury is gonna be right in here. So what does that mean for me? Well, any of the stuff that's below that is gonna be stuff that my brain doesn't regulate in kind of the normal way. So for example, all of the muscles of my hips, my legs and my feet, those muscles still exist and they can still contract, but I can't consciously control them. I can't think about my feet moving and then make that happen. 
because the signal is going to travel down from my brain through my spinal cord. It's going to get to that injury in that L2, L3 section right there, and that signal can't go any farther. So the muscles in my legs and my feet and my hips and all that, they never get the signal to go ahead and contract. I still have reflexes though. So if I were to like, I don't know, poke my leg with a needle or something, the muscles in my leg would still start to contract like that. I still have the reflex because the signal can travel from my skin and my leg to the spinal cord and then back out to a muscle. I just wouldn't feel the pain from that because that signal can't make it up the spinal cord to my brain. And I'll go a lot more in depth with that in a later video. All right, let's do a quick recap here of all of this stuff. So we have five sections of the spinal cord starting at the top. We have the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and the coccygeal. The cervical has eight, the thoracic 12, the lumbar five, the sacral five, and the coccygeal one for a total of 31 pairs of nerves. Those are pairs of nerves, right? Because we have one come out the left and one come out the right for each of those sections. I really like how the numbers kind of work out nice and neat. The eight at the top plus 12 gives us a nice round 20. And then we have five and five giving us a nice round 30. And then there's kind of one at the end. So eight, 12, five, five, one. Those nerves are gonna form several plexuses, plexi, plexuses. We have the brachial plexus at the top. Then we have the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. We also have the cauda equina, which is gonna be where the tube of the spinal cord starts to kind of split and form this horse tail-like section in the spine. For somatic control, specifically motor, our cervical nerves are gonna control things like the neck, the diaphragm for breathing, and then our shoulder, arm, and hands. The thoracic is gonna control everything in our kind of torso area. So our intercostal or rib muscles, our trunk everywhere above the waist and our abdominals. Down here, the lumbar and the sacral are gonna control movement of our hips, our legs and our feet, basically the whole lower body. And the coccygeal nerve has no motor control, but it does deal with some tailbone sensation. That's all the somatic control. And then we also have the autonomic division. So we've got cranial nerves, which are gonna control our rest and digest system for most of the body. We'll cover all that in another cranial nerve video later on. Our sacral nerves are gonna be involved in parasympathetic control as well. And that's gonna be specifically of the bladder causing it to contract and the reproductive organs causing increased flow to the reproductive organs. So if you're really stressed out, it's gonna be harder to do reproductive organ kind of stuff. And then finally, our thoracic and lumbar sections, those are gonna be involved in our sympathetic stimulation. So whenever we're engaged in a stress response, Signals will come through those thoracic nerves and lumbar nerves to the organs of our body right here in order to increase our stress response. So like our heart beating faster, lungs breathing faster, but also suppressing our digestive system and things like that. Finally, if you're trying to learn all this stuff and really remember it, the only way to do that is to practice yourself. All right, here we have a blank diagram. Take a minute, pause the video, see if you can name all of the sections, the number of nerves in each section, the other anatomical parts of this, as well as what each section of the spinal cord controls or regulates. We have the cervical, which is eight nerves. We have the thoracic of 12 nerves. We have the lumbar region with five nerves, the sacral with five nerves, and the coccygeal nerve. The cervical is gonna control all of those regions, neck, diaphragm, shoulder, arm, hand. The thoracic will control the trunk and the ribs and the abdominals. We have the lumbar and sacral, which is gonna control the hips, legs, and feet. Coccygeal for tailbone sensation. We have cranial nerves controlling the parasympathetic response. Cervical doesn't do anything with the autonomic. We have the thoracic with sympathetic stimulation, our stress response, and the sacral for parasympathetic stimulation of the bladder and reproductive organs. And then some anatomical regions we talked about, the brachial plexus, cauda equina, lumbar plexus, and sacral plexus. Like I said, this is just the first video in a series of videos on the spine and spinal cord and cranial nerves and kind of all that nervous system stuff. And I already have videos on the brain and neuron and action potential and synapses and a bunch of other topics in the nervous system. So if you click the video link over here or over there, that'll take you to a playlist of nervous system videos. All right, I'll catch you in the next video.